When it comes to narrative, a good narrative can elevate what seems like a fairly standard video game into something that's much more memorable for years to come. Take Spec Ops The Line or even the Telltale games for example. It's not going to win any awards or reach new heights in the gameplay department, but instead, it's how the game engages the viewer to become enriched in the storyline and its world. And that's kind of the way I look at Bioshock, it wasn't a gameplay defining kind of game, instead it decided to focus on that narrative side and people still remember it from the original release 10 years ago simply because of how good the narrative, writing and story was. I think that's something to be said. But how did this crazy series come to be? What crazy genius is behind the scary underwater city of Rapture in the strange new world of Columbia? And is the series all over, or will we see another game in the Bioshock universe? Welcome to the first of two parts of our Bioshock documentary series, where we'll be exploring all three games and how they were made as we take a trip beyond the sea. So long, Hello, hello, can you hear me? Well, hi there, fellow game players and BAFTA patrons. We all make choices, but in the end, our choices make us, he once wrote. So tonight, we choose to meet with him in the hope that it'll make us all a little more informed about his worlds and, by extension, perhaps ours. Would you kindly give it up for Irrational Games' creative director, Ken Levine? Our story starts with a young Ken Levine. Levine, who just finished studying drama at Vassier College in New York, was looking to pursue a career in film as a screenwriter, so he moved to LA in the hope for more opportunities. However, in 1995, he found a job advertisement in a gaming magazine from a studio called Looking Glass Studios. For me, the luckiest thing that ever happened, I was a huge fan of this game, System Shock, a huge fan. And at that point, when I was playing that game, and I always played video games, I didn't even realize people made games. I just thought they sort of showed up in a box somewhere. And um, I was reading this magazine at the time, uh, the great magazine that doesn't exist anymore called Next Gen. And um, there was an ad in the back for um, for you know game for game designers. And I'm like, okay, what's, what the hell's a game designer? And I applied for the job. And like a week later, they flew me up there. And like a week later, they hired me. And I found myself in a room with a guy named Doug Church, who is one of the great unsung heroes of video games. He was the guy behind Ultima Underworld. He was the guy behind um, System Shock 1. And he and I got to work together on, on Thief. It's like getting hired in the film industry out of college and getting put in a room with Steven Spielberg in your first week. It was incredible. And I'm, I'm forever grateful for that opportunity. Ken joined Looking Glass Studios and helped create the world of Thief, and its 1998 release saw huge praise from critics alike, and a new series Looking Glass Studios could continue to make games for. Praised for his work on Thief, Ken rather than continue on with one of the writers in the company, had other, bigger ideas. Following the success of Thief, Ken along with two fellow co-workers founded Irrational Games. Um, when we started um, Irrational, you know, as I said, we were, uh, it was three of us, John Che, Rob Fermier, and myself, and we, one of us had shipped a game. Rob Fermier had shipped a game. He had worked on the original System Shock. And John and I hadn't. And I'm not exactly sure, again, how I lucked out into this, but we managed to make a deal with Looking Glass and EA to develop System Shock 2. And at that point, we really didn't know what we were doing at all. Here I was, president of the company, I was lead designer, and I had never shipped a game. I had worked on Thief, but it hadn't shipped yet. And we were really wondering how we were gonna make this game, because the Dark Engine, which was the engine, same engine that Thief was built on, 
was not really a shooter engine. You know, it didn't compare to the quakes of the time. It, it, was, it was sort of slow and a little clumsy, but it did certain things really well. It did a level of detail really well. So we looked at the engine and we said, okay, well, it's not gonna run very fast, but it does a lot of detail. Well, what if we combined, you know, shooting and RPG, and we really focused on story. The new company alongside Looking Glass Studios would start creation on the follow-up to Looking Glass's 1994 sci-fi RPG shooter, System Shock. Ken would be lead writer and designer on System Shock 2, and development would start in 1997. And so we were just like every day figuring out what the hell we were supposed to be doing. Um, and we were, we, I was also running the company, right? So I had, had to deal with like payroll and insurance and all this crap, which I had no idea about. I had no interest in it either, but you gotta pay people. Um, so you have to figure it out. And so we were so desperate just to keep our heads above water. We didn't even have time to think about the future. We just try to get the thing done. and. You know, I, I think I learned a lesson then that the most important thing is to make something that you want to play um, because then you have a chance, that love that you put into that, if you don't love it, nobody else is going to. So we did, the, good, the best thing about System Shock 2 is we were basically given free reign to make the game we wanted to make and we made the game we wanted to play. This is the AV room of Looking Glass Studios, which is no longer a corporate entity, unfortunately, disappointing many fans across the nation. This is the view that Steve Russell, the voice of Garrett, had many a day as he sat and recorded those incredible voiceovers for Thief and Thief 2. Why not? Armadillos. Oh my god, this room is clean. We go out of business and the room gets cleaned. What's up with that? <laughs> well, my thoughts on this whole deal? You got that? A lot of us will move on to new things. Absolutely. And I kind of... It's very difficult to start something up. I kind of see this as a birth for like a thousand new things that we can all do. I mean, it's like, like you know, when an asteroid hits the Earth, it, it wipes out 90% of what's there, but also, you know, it, it promotes evolution. Stuff will, good stuff will happen from this, but it's painful. It's been a fun ride. I wish it was, uh, the car hadn't run out of gas, but I guess the, the looking glass cat has used up its last life. Sad but true. This is well, the greatest like group of people I've ever worked with in my life. And I just love y'all. Good luck. Alright, go for it. Go. Any way you want, just go home. Looking Glass Studios would go on to create titles such as Destruction Derby 64 and Thief 2, but in the year 2000, Looking Glass hit major financial losses and a lack of funding, and therefore closed its doors in May of that year. While System Shock 2 was a success, it wasn't in the financial department, and when Ken approached EA to make a sequel, it was rejected due to the poor sales of System Shock 2. Levine went on to make games such as Freedom Force, he was the writer for Tried Vengeance, and he was the producer for SWAT 4. The projects did well, but nothing like the impact and success that System Shock 2 created. It wasn't until 2002 that a game about a man and an underwater city would come to light. The idea of doing a similar game to System Shock 2 toyed with Levine over the years, however with no funding coming from EA, this idea wasn't coming anytime soon. Despite this, Ken and the team at Irrational Games decided to create the next idea for their game anyway, to help visually showcase what they could bring to the table, even if the chosen publisher wasn't interested. Bioshock has been sort of in the company's blood for a very long time, and um, it's a game we sort of always wanted to do and always talked about. and. We ne for a while didn't have a name, but then uh, I think probably around f four or five years ago, it's sort of the name Bioshock came around for it, um, and we we always had a bunch of design principles that were pretty firm that it was a game that was going to take first-person shooting in a, in a different direction, um, build upon principles of games we had done before, like System Shock Two, but really then take a different um, 
attack with that, where, where, that, where that game was very sort of under the hood, numbery, and RPG statty, to really say, let's, let's work on world simulation and immersion and AI and build up player choice through, um, through things he can see in the world rather than numbers that are working under the hood. You know, we really started with this idea of, well, let's make a game like Shock 2, but make it our own, make it different. And, you know, we didn't really have a story or anything like that. All we had this idea for uh, what kind of gameplay we wanted. So this uh, kind of emergent world, a sandbox world, uh, and we just wanted to build out from there. In 2002, the team created a demo which mainly circled on a new first-person shooter type of experience. Among some of the characters and elements in the demo were mechanical drones that would carry a desirable yet unknown resource, protectors that would guard the drones, and harvesters that would attempt to steal said resource from the drones. In time, this became the starting concept for Bioshock. The team was still yet to figure out what it all exactly meant, and how they used this simple idea in the game, but at least it was a start. The 2002 demo was sent to EA and other potential publishers. It featured a space station setting similar to System Shock 2, but with an updated engine, using Unreal Engine 2. The space station was overrun with genetically mutated monsters, and a main character called Carlos Corello, who was a cult deprogrammer. The narrative of the demo would be Carlos looking to save people from a particular cult, but what a cult deprogrammer does is adjust the person mentally and psychologically so that they wouldn't be in the cult and therefore turn them back into a normal person. Um, and we built, you know, internally funded and built a, number, a couple of prototypes which are radically different from, um, from what the game is today. But um, I think, you know, when you're trying to do something like Bioshock, it, it, it's not saying you sort of wake up one morning and like know what it is right away. And it was you know, the collective talent of a lot of people and a lot of time to get the game where it is today. We did a, a demo early on, probably 2003, that it, I wish we could find it. It was on Xbox One and it was, you know, it was still underwater, but it looked a lot like a space station and everything was really clean and Star Trek-y and the monsters were of like the Scooby-Doo variety. It was all over the place as far as aesthetics. While the concept sounded interesting, the team collectively began thinking that this concept wasn't working out in the long run. And they were still having issues trying to find a suitable publisher for the game, or for at least the idea they had. Development and the dream of creating a System Shock predecessor seemed to be coming to an end. Word got out through gaming magazines and websites about Irrational Games' attempts to create a spiritual successor to System Shock. Although this started to generate hype in the public side around what kind of game would come out of the team, publishers were still not calling to make a deal. It was time for a new approach from Ken and the team. They felt like they had something, but it just wasn't quite there just yet. It was also around this time that a certain Gene Paul LeBrenton heard about the rumours and decided to apply for a job at Irrational Games. System Shock 2 was one of his favourite games of all time and made him want to get into the game's development industry, so it only seemed right that he would join. The team stuck their heads in the sand for the next few months and finally they got the call. 2K Games offered to publish the game based off the idea of the drone protector harvester concept, and this allowed Irrational to have relief and freedom to concentrate on the story and the setting. In 2004, shortly after the publishing deal was agreed, the team had already come up with a new concept for the game. The story evolved a lot over time, but like originally, we, you know, once we had this notion of that there was a genetic engineering experimentation going on in the world, we started thinking, what would that do? We started thinking, what would that do to this culture? And originally, we had this notion that the city was run by um, a series of what we called savants. We started out with this concept of savants that <laughs> were like these genetically engineered characters that went so far they became sort of like brains in a jar kind of thing. And you were originally going to defeat a different savant on every level as you progress through the game and. And it just, there were too many characters, they didn't make any sense, and, and it got really, really out of control. So we sort of pulled back from some of those yeah, ideas. Plus interacting with a guy in a, a jar is it? Yeah, is it, really it was like, how are you going to have a boss fight with a guy in a jar? It just, it was just a stupid idea, ultimately. You know, we had this 212-page design document laying out how every single thing in the game would work, from the controller mapping down to, you know, all, this, all the scripting components for the designers. And... I mean, the, the programming team did an amazing job, and we, we got all of that stuff done. 
but it just wasn't helping us create the experience we wanted to make. So we all had to come kind of step back from that and say, well, you know, what went wrong? Um, and so that was a low point. Um, but it was very good in a way in that it made us realize that we were, I think we were designing in our heads and then just throwing it over the fence. And, um, you know, the programmers were working on this huge backlog of tasks they had to do and slowly feeding that to the designers. But by the time the designers got the technology they requested, they had forgotten they even wanted it. I mean, it was that, that kind of process where it was like, you know, a slow moving pipeline. And we changed our process to be more of an iterative one where programmers were working very closely with designers and saying, well, what are we trying to do right now? What's this experience we're trying to make? How do we do that? What is the you know, minimal set of tech we need to make that happen? And you know, let's get it done and try it really quick. And so we took that low point and kind of turned it into, I think it became kind of a turning point for the project. So that was very good. The original design was like <laughs> way heavier into RPG type yeah. things as well. We had prerequisites on everything. You couldn't mm. hack this unless you had that. You couldn't shoot this unless you found that. Like you really there was couldn't all do anything, stuff. really. It was, yeah, and it was, yeah. <laughs> as, as we started getting these systems working, we were just like, gamers have to do way too much to get to the cool, fun stuff in this game. So we just started stripping all of that away. And it got more and more at its heart. The, the heart of the shooter kept bubbling more and more to the top. The team had a setting, but yet again, they felt like they shouldn't go ahead with the idea of crazy scientists or brains in a jar. But they did have one thing, the city known as Rapture, an underwater city that was hidden away from everyday life of today. I was sort of like waiting for the game to tell me what the story should be. And there was a lot of things about that evolved over the course of the game that sort of pointed in that direction. Like, you know, we, we knew we wanted the game to be in a place that was remote from the world, but complete, because whenever I play games that are take place in an actual place, like, you know, you have a game that takes place in Seattle or New York, and you go up to a, you know, there's a jersey barrier there you can't jump over, and or you go up to a guy who's like working in a store, and you can only say one or two things to him. And that always frustrates me because I'd rather simulate something completely and give the player, never have that, never press on that um, suspension of disbelief where the player is like, wait, why can't I do that? I'd rather make a world where the player can do everything they can expect to do. And I think the team wants to do that. And so we had to sort of come up with a place that was natural, that it, we could, where, where you could do everything you wanted to do, but also you, you're never saying, why can't I just get in a car and drive off? Or why can't I talk to that guy? Or why can't I talk to this guy? And um, you know, this underwater city sort of came out of that, that if there was this, this place that was cut off, um, that you couldn't leave, and that was self-contained we could really go to town and make simulate not just the world but the culture and the products and the people and the history and I didn't want to do like a, a strange science fiction world because that's always going to be hard to relate to so we made a place that was sort of like an, its own little alternate history and everything sort of evolved out of that because I had to ask myself if we're going to make this believable why would somebody build a city at the bottom of the ocean and you know that's where the that's where Bioshock's story came from. It's like asking that question: Why would somebody do this? And um, trying to come up with a believable answer, and everything came out of that. The idea of Rapture stuck with the team, but they're still struggling to come up with uses for the drones, protectors, and harvesters from the original game idea. What was their identity? What did they mean to the game and story? The team just didn't know yet. They finally reached on an idea they had for the protectors, which came early on in the process. They were called the Big Daddy. The idea for the new drones came from brainstorming shortly after when Ken made it clear to the team that he wanted the player to have a reason to care for them, but also have a reason for the player not to care for them. In came the Little Sisters. The Little Sisters would present the player with a major choice in the game. Do you save the Little Sisters in the hope that they become normal again? Or do you kill them for Adam? 2K Games decided to step in shortly after, not happy with how long it was taking to develop and the approach. 2K didn't like the idea of having the player prey on the little sisters and therefore setting up a fight with their protectors, the Big Daddy. 2K Games threatened to not ship the game because they didn't want the player punished for doing the right thing. So much to the team's dismay, they changed it so that the Little Sisters could not be harmed until the player had dealt with the Big Daddy first. 2K also wanted to have multiple endings depending on the choice of the player with saving or harvesting the Little Sisters. Again, Ken didn't want to do this at all. The City of Rapture is, is, was built with, by Andrew Ryan and his team with 
a, a real strong philosophical bent, and that bent was um, that people, you know, as he says, is a man not entitled to the sweat of his own brow. And he was, you know, he lived in a time in America where he came, first of all, he was born in the Soviet Union and during the around the time of the revolution or before the revolution, and he saw what happened with the revolution and he was an anti-communist and he came to America. He felt that if he was a great man, he should be entitled to the fruit of his own labor. He didn't want the government or the church or, you know, anybody like anybody else telling him what was or wasn't his, which I think, you know, is, is to an American is a very sort of understandable concept. Um, and he felt so strongly about this that he felt he couldn't stay in America, especially with the you know, coming threat of nuclear war, with the new nuclear weapons after World War II. And he wanted to take the, you know, what he considered the best and the brightest people to a place where they could practice their, their craft, whatever their craft was, artist, you know, scientist, um, um, industrialist, and do it without another person's hand in their pocket. And um, that's why he created Rapture. In Bioshock, the Civil War happens because of very natural things. Greed, you know, sex, jealousy, power, you know, all the things that screw up everything in, rea in reality. And also, but also the things that drive us all um, are the very things that, 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 that cause the Civil War in Rapture. The great thing I think about Bioshock from where I'm sitting as, as a writer um, is that Nobody's perfect. Like you, there are no paragons. Or there is no, you know, Gandalf. There is no, um, um, there is no um, Ben Kenobi. Um, all the characters you encounter, Tenenbaum and Atlas and Ryan and the people you hear about, like Fontaine, and the people you read, you hear about in their audio diaries, and you encounter everybody. Um, everybody um, is flawed in substantial ways. And you're sort of put in this position with all these moral choices of like, who am I going to listen to? And there's no, no, there's no black hats and white hats. And everybody's had a sort of a dark gray. Well, you know, the diaries are, are a great way of telling the story, though we have to assume that not everybody's going to listen to all those because there's play, people playing a first person shooter. There's going to be a contingent of people who really care about that and we really support them. The story is really detailed and, and rich. Um, but. And there's incredible amount of detail. And you can put the whole history of Rapture together from those from those audio diaries. We very carefully wrote them and chose them. Um, there's um, just listening to the world, listening to the public service announcements as you, as you walk around the world, various advertisements from the world, um, just seeing the vending machines, watching the Big Daddy and Little Sister interact, seeing these sort of ghostly scenes that you come across, and you find out why there are ghosts ghosts in Rapture. Um, there's you know, a dozen storytelling mediums in the game, and they're all really rich, and they're all designed that even the person who's playing it the most casual way is going to get a sense of what's happening here. At E3 2006, the team finally showed an early gameplay demo to the public, with Ken given a commentary on the gameplay. What are we trying to do? It's pretty ambitious. What we're trying to do is to redefine what it means to be a first person shooter. Our goal is to put a stake in the heart of all those cliches you've been playing for years in first-person shooters, the linear corridors, the very static environments, and the cookie-cutter AIs. Now, we understand that's a pretty lofty goal, and it's really gonna be up to you guys to decide whether we succeed. But with that said, let's go to the world of Rapture and take a look at Bioshock. Welcome to Rapture. That was, I think, the first point where the team uh, I mean, one of the great things about working on games is that you, you work together as a team and you go through these like crunches where you're all driving towards this huge deadline. And contrasting that with the original vision demo that we did, E3 was an experience where like we got done and we said, yeah, like this, this really is showing us that uh, we can make our vision a reality. So that was a huge um, motivating force for the team. Everybody's really excited. And of course, like we didn't expect to get <laughs> all the great press that we got. So that was, that was really gratifying and rewarding. And we looked at all these cool systems we had and, and the, all the weapons and the plasmas. We said, well, if we took all this stuff and like really focused on a shooter, we could have the deepest shooter like mm -hmm. <laughs> pretty much ever. And uh, right. we, just, we didn't want to miss on that opportunity. You know, the E3 demo was kind of showing you uh, the mood of Bioshock and the world and the art direction. and. Uh, for Barcelona, we wanted to show people, well, 
All right, well, we've shown you how kind of creepy and different this game is and why it's interesting visually and conceptually. Now let's show you why it's going to be an amazing shooter. And uh, that was just, that was great. Um, basically, uh, you know, took all the little bits of the game that happened emergently and threw them all into one demo so you can see, like, what happens when all hell breaks loose in this game. What we did with that, we had this huge chunk of a level and sort of all these things sort of sprawling around. And then Ken came in one day and he was like, okay, here's the theme of the demo. The theme is hunting the big daddy. I want to know that we're starting here and our goal is this and we do these things on our way and then we get there and we have the climax. And it's the combination of him having that vision and us knowing how much we have to throw at it makes a presentation for the fans It says, like, look, we're just telling you a little story. This is how to understand our game. And actually, after that demo, when we realized how amazing that experience was, and Ken came up to me and he said, well, you know, the XO6 demo where you're, you're fighting, you know, you have two security bots and they're fighting this giant protector who's on fire and there's a gatherer and there's this guy throwing grenades off the balcony at you and you're shooting machine guns and stuff's exploding. He says, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, it's amazing. I'm glad we pulled that off. Now, I want the game to be like that all the time. <laughs> and I looked at him and I was like, I don't know if we can do that. Um, you know, because that was a very small level in the game. Um, and so coming off that high point in Barcelona, heading downward, realizing we had to uh, make the whole game like that, uh, that took some adjusting. But then we actually started pulling it off, which is great. Um, you know, the, uh, our tech team in Australia has been just optimizing, optimizing, optimizing. And just when we think we've squeezed the last ounce of power out of the, out of the PC or the console, like they find another way to improve it. And, uh, and the game is actually like that all the time now. Like you're constantly having these massive battles, all kinds of crazy stuff going on. And um, it's, uh, it's great to see that. I mean, Comparing it with games I've played in the past and worked on in the past, the, the current game is just so much more dense and chaotic, and uh, at the same time still very creepy and lonely and uh, dystopian. So I think, I think we kind of cheated our vision and hopefully uh, people will like the game. Even though a demo was out and shown off to the public, at this point tensions started to grow between the developers and publisher. 2K were concerned about the ever-increasing delays and budget for the game, and they ordered Irrational to polish up the game in three months. In January of 2007, a playtest of the game was scheduled, but to the team's frustration, it came off as mostly negative. There was issues, for example, brought up in the game that it was too dark in terms of lighting, they had nowhere to go, and even Atlas, the first main character that talks to you in Rapture, was coming off rather distrusting, even at an early stage. The team scrambled to fix the issue brought up by the playtest by improving the lighting, implementing a quest marker, and having an Irish voiceover for Atlas to make him sound more trustworthy. I am Andrew Ryan, and I'm here to ask you a question. Is a man not entitled to the sweat of his brow. No, says the man in Washington, it belongs to the poor. No, says the man in the Vatican, it belongs to God. No, says the man in Moscow, it belongs to everyone. I rejected those answers. Instead, I chose something different. I chose the impossible. I chose On August 2007, with a final budget of $25 million, Bioshock was released to the world. With the release of the game, Levine stated that Bioshock could have really used about six more months to fix some of the issues in the game. For some, that didn't matter, as Bioshock received huge praise throughout the gaming world, with many marking it a huge successor to System Shock 2 and the start of an exciting new series. Rapture was praised for its creepy, disturbing tone throughout, with many hailing it as one of the best level designs in a video game ever. It is still rated one of the highest rated games on Metacritic today, 
and won many Game of the Year awards in 2007. While the gunplay or the combat wasn't as revolutionary, it was still the narrative-driven gameplay that hooked me and many others when this game first came out. But why was Bioshock 2 such a disappointment? Why was Bioshock Infinite set in the clouds and not in Rapture? And why did Ken Levine leave Irrational Games after the huge success that was Bioshock Infinite? All those questions will be answered in the second part of this documentary. I do hope you join me then. Thank you for watching. See you next time.